Date with a Debut is a Words and Nerds and Breathe Art Podcasts co-production recorded on a Wapical country. And I pay my respects to all elders, past and present, and extend that to any First Nations people tuning in. Always was, always will be, Aboriginal land. On with the show. Welcome to Date With A Debut, a podcast about debut authors, their incredible books, and their journey to publication. If you are looking for a new author to discover or writing inspiration for your own story and you don't know where to start, this is the place to be. I'm Nick Wasiliev, author of When Men Cry and your host for today's show, and I'm delighted to welcome another debut author in today's episode. If you enjoy the show or indeed any other shows on the Words and Nerds platform, jump online and give us a thumbs up, a five-star review, wherever you are listening. Thank you for listening to us and for supporting the Australian book industry. You can also find any books mentioned in today's podcast down in the description. We're also excited to announce that Words and Nerds, including this podcast, has a special partnership with Booktopia until the 22nd of May, 2024. Order any books mentioned in this podcast down in the description from booktopia.com.au, Australia's local bookstore, and use the promo code WORDS10 at checkout to receive 10% off your order. See the description below for links and terms and conditions. This episode is a very special one in the life of Date With A Debut. In April 2024, I had the pleasure of taking part at the Newcastle Writers' Festival, a magnificent celebration of national and regional authors brilliantly put together by an incredible team spearheaded by Rosemary Milsom and Amy Lovett, who also previously appeared on this show. On Sunday, 7th of April 2024, I had the pleasure of hosting a live version of Date With A Debut as one of the final events of the 2024 festival, where I spoke with Rosemary Lewis, John Morrissey and Megan Rogers. Welcome one and all to Date with a Debut at the Newcastle Writers' Festival. I'm Nick Wasiliev, author of a novel called When Men Cry and host of a a podcast, Date with a Debut, which is on the Words and Nerds channel. And I'm super excited to be hosting this special event this afternoon in this beautiful, magical city. Before we begin, myself, along with the Newcastle Writers' Festival, acknowledge that we meet on unceded country, uh, the lands of the Awapakal and the Waramai peoples. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and continuing relationship with the land, waters and the community. We pay our respects to Elders past and present and for any Aboriginal people who have joined us today, we extend that to you warmly. Housekeeping, before we dive into the session, (laughs) we ask that uh, all phones be switched to silent. We all love talking about these amazing books uh, and I know everyone would prefer that uh, without a surprise phone call. (laughs) <laughs> We've all been there. Um, and then secondly, if you are on the socials or if you're tweeting and talking around and coming to the festival to see a favourite author, let the festival know. The Newcastle Writers Festival is on all social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Use the hashtag NWF2024. Um, lastly, we won't be taking uh, audience questions in this particular Um, session. However, once the session is concluded, you'll have the chance to meet these incredible authors uh, at a special book signing which is located on the ground floor um, in the foyer of New Space. So, with that in mind, welcome to Date With A Debut. This session is being recorded live, thanks to our wonderful sound engineer. Thank you, mate. Um, And we'll be also out on the Words and Nerds channel. Um, So I extend a a warm welcome, welcome to everyone who is listening on the airwaves after the fact. (laughs) Um, This event is about debut authors, their incredible books, um, and their journey to publication. If you are looking for a new author to discover, writing inspiration for your own story and you don't know where to start, this is the place to be. So joining me today, without further ado, are three incredible authors. We'll start from the far side and make our way across. John Morrissey is a Kalkadoon writer, uh, raised in Melbourne. His work has been published in Overland and Mianjin and we'll be discussing his first collection of stories, Firelight, which was published by Text Publishing in 2023. Next to him is Rosemary Lewis, a retired teacher, 
B&B owner, and in proof that age is just a number, published her debut memoir, Life's Not a Paragraph, at the age of 93. Yeah. And lastly, right next to me is Megan Rogers, formerly an editorial assistant before transitioning over to becoming a writer like the rest of us. Uh, she has taught, she ta uh, ta teaches creative writing in, in universities for the last 10 years, and her debut novel, The Heart is a Star, was published by Catherine Milne by HarperCollins Australia under the Fourth Estate imprint and became a bestseller. <laughs> <laughs> so with that in mind, please welcome our wonderful panel. So let's dive deep into these books and we'll start in classic fashion with a classic book pitch. Um, and I immediately have to go to you, Rosemary. <laughs> Tell us about your incredible memoir. Well, <laughs> I'm going to cry. <laughs> oh. oh, this is just so special. Is it special? Being a debutante at 94. Right, 1981 <clears throat> and I'm 51. It's the beginning of the year. And I attempted to suicide. So that's chapter one of my book. It was a disgraceful thing to do. It was shameful. It was secret. But I have to acknowledge that because it's the wellspring of my story. From that event comes my second life. So I grabbed that second life, and you'll see by chapter two, I've left Sydney, home and husband. Uh, I found new work teaching drama at the University of Tasmania. I board a plane, I land in Hobart, I fall in love with a 1860s heritage house, six bedrooms in Battery Point, and I purchased it after a morning's conversation with a bank manager. Can you imagine a bank manager talking to you for half the day <laughs> in the bank, in the bank behind his desk? And, and at the end of that conversation, he said, I think I can get you a loan because in 1981, women couldn't have a mortgage, couldn't have a loan. He said, if you will agree to set up tourist accommodation for travellers, the government has said, we will give you a loan. Would you set up bed and breakfast, he said. And I said, would I ever? <laughs> <laughs> So that's how I, I had a bed and breakfast in Hobart. It's a, it's, and that's just the start of the story. It's an incredible memoir, um, Rosemary. And also the, you, you worked with, uh, with a Hunter Valley publishing house to get it, to, to bring it together. And of course, the story continues on. <laughs> but I'm very curious, you, we, we were talking beforehand and it took Rosemary five years to, to write this story and to write your life down. Why did now feel like the right time? Because in, oh, no, dates are hard. <laughs> 19, 20, 2017, I retired. I was what, 87, 88? And I decided it was time to stop work because I've always been a worker. So I downsized, went to a, a place on the flat from, and I thought, what do I do now? Now I've always written, it's been the way I've got to know what I'm thinking always and the way to vent my feelings. And I thought I'd like to recreate the marvellous life I had in Hobart. It was a magic life. And so in one of the uh, boxes I had in the move, out came the notes I'd made about guests at my bed and breakfast. And I thought, that's what I'm going to write about. So before I tell you about that, let me go, go back, may I? 
uh, a moment to say that when I started the bed and breakfast, there was an explosion of energy you might have heard up here. Because I'd throw off the apron after the eggs and bacon and I'd race to the university and it was such a thrill, so energising to teach these final year drama students. And then I'd go home and I'd be trying to, what do I do next to get this accommodation set up, to get a business running, because I had no experience at all. But those from the beginning experiences really fanned my desire to, oh, I didn't know that I had these desires. But for the first time, I had money of my own. That's the secret. <laughs> money of your own. And means I could spend it as I wanted to. So I bought the most wonderful antique furniture. Hobart was full of it then. And I also bought art. So my house became filled with antiques and art and it became a central uh, accommodation place in Hobart. Although I spent big, because I'd been brought up as a very strict Methodist, I was prudent with money. So I watched the red and blue columns from the bank and I never got into debt. Important, yeah, right. Now, many stories go back to this first time when I welcomed guests in and had no idea what to do. So there came a knock at the door, I went out, and they said, oh, we're the uh, garden club from Victoria, we've booked in. Oh, said I, I didn't know about that. <laughs> oh, I didn't realise that the Tourist Bureau, the government, was booking guests in and I was supposed to know about it. <laughs> so they said, look, we like the look of you, we like the look of the house, we'd like to stay. If you will allocate the rooms, we'll make the beds, we'll hang the curtains, we'll do everything. And that's what they did. I raced off to the supermarket to buy eggs and bacon, <laughs> soap and toilet paper. They bought me flowers, they took me to dinner, and the tourist bureau sent me the money. So it was a marvellous beginning. <laughs> And before I go on, have I got a minute? Of course. Two minutes? Yeah. <laughs> I'll just tell you one story because the book is full of stories, uh, all different kinds of guests. But I remember the bikey. And I'd got home from teaching one afternoon and sank into a chair and then was eating dinner. It was probably scallops or prawns or, you know, Tasmanian salmon, something like that. And I heard the roar of a Harley. <laughs> you know that roar? I can't resist it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it stopped right outside my fence. And a few minutes later, I heard <gasps> in the hall, oh, such a step. So I peeped out and here right down the end of the long hall was a bikey in full black shining bikey regalia. <laughs> Got a room for the night he asked. <laughs> <laughs> well I put the bike. <laughs> He threw a wad of notes onto the credenza, walked round, and I locked all the doors. <laughs> and that night I went to bed fully dressed. <laughs> because I was alone in the house. Yeah. Well, what would you do, you know? <laughs> but anyway, next morning for breakfast, it was a different story. He emerged from his ro room in jeans and a singlet and he was covered in black tattoos. 
I'd never seen anything like it. <laughs> and so when I put the eggs and bacon on to the table, you know, and I stood there not knowing, you know, how do I make conversation or what do I... And I said, oh, you've got so many tattoos. <laughs> do they mean something? And he said, that's Lord of the Rings. All the stories are there. Oh, wow. And then I saw another one. What's that one? That's, that's my daughter, he said, Clyde. And he said, haven't seen her since Christmas. She won't give me access. And, you know, tears started to fall down his cheeks. So I stood there sort of silently grieving with him. Well, you know what to do, don't you? I asked. He said, yeah, no good. She won't let me. So we finished eating and stood up and said, it's been so good staying here. I'll be back when my own bike's fixed. So off he went. And that's just one of many stories in the book. It's about the education of Rosemary, really. Mm. <laughs> it's a beautiful book. It's a very beautiful book, and I cannot stress it enough for you to check it out. It's a, a story on an incredible life. And I have one last question to poke you with about it, which, because I'm often, you know, people often look at these stories and these memories anew when they write them down. And I wonder, Rosemary, what did making this book teach you about your life? Oh, goodness me. <laughs> uh, go back a little way to answer that. Mm -hmm. There's a third strand in the plot of the book. I fell in love with a man 16 years younger. This is pretty exciting for a woman of 51. <laughs> now, we lived a Midsummer Night's Dream for a number of years. It was as if Puck had anointed our eyes, you know, with the magic love potion. You remember the story? And we behaved in uncharacteristic ways. <laughs> <laughs> we lived like opera stars. Full pelt. At times, it was a rough ride. But one of the learnings from the book is I wouldn't be with my live-out partner of, what, 23 years if it hadn't have been for Donald. So one of the big learnings was about your relationship with men, particularly with a man, and learning not to stay in a relationship where you don't, where you have to put up with anything that you normally wouldn't. So that's one of the big things from the whole experience. From writing the book, oh, there's a whole lot more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I suppose. <coughs> Regret, because I've always written. I've got a poem I wrote when I was four. I used to climb up the stairs into the school, because Dad was the headmaster there, uh, and do what the other kids were doing, you know, with bits of crayon and reading. And So I knew that these marks meant something. So I wrote early, and I continued to write throughout my life, in Hobart, somebody gave me a um, how to write romance book and challenged me to write a Mills and Boom. Well, I've got that Mills and Boom in a, book, in a box at home. So I've always written 
what I regret is that I could never find time to sit down and write. You know, it's, that's something... Um, you know, writing's a job. And you've got to have a writing routine, if you like, a discipline, and you've got to, to work at it. Now, I always put that off because I'm a worker. And I think, like a lot of women anyway, we find things to do. There was always the mending, the ironing, the cooking, the gardening, the everything, you know. And I'm really good at that because there are so many things I enjoy doing. But I didn't sit down to write. And it was only after I'd retired that I had the endless time to sit down and write. And now I don't know whether I've got endless time or no, I haven't. I don't know how much. But that's what I want to do now because that started something in me. That's answer. Beautiful answer. I love it. <laughs> but particularly, I could see, I could see both Meg and John like absolutely nodding their heads, writing it. There is an art to it and a craft to it, and it is a job. It very much is. Similarly for you, Meg, uh, the story of your book is incredible. Um, the Heart is a Star. And um, it's it's been of uh, the story of it and how it and where it has gone and where it has travelled to has been incredible, to put it simply. For everyone who isn't familiar, what is the heart is a star about? <laughs> it's always a million dollar question, isn't it? I know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, I just, uh, okay, so um, the heart is a star is essentially about Layla Burns. She's an anaesthetist. Uh, in a hospital and so there are undercurrents of themes of numbing and the subterranean lives that we lead both internally and externally and she uh, is a mother and a wife and a daughter and a friend and all of those things and there's a line in the book that says um, you know she's in her late 40s and she says all the women in me are tired and that cuts to I think the heart of the compartmentalisation of women's identities and the roles that we play in many of our lives and the ways that she, um, I guess, puts her own needs and desires at the bottom of the list um, quite often and doesn't... Um, I was actually listening to the advice going... I'm taking the opportunity to really listen and learn to from, um, from advice given. I would have written it down, actually, if I could have. But um, so... Layla races to the west coast of Tasmania, so a lot of it is set on the west coast of Tassie where my grandfather and my grandparents herald from. And uh, she races to try and save her mother, basically. And in doing so, really saves her own life and her, her own identity. And there are some pretty big twists in the book. So that's kind of... That's, they're the main things that I will say. But I don't write auto biographically per se because um, I like to write novels the way I read which is kind of uncovering stories and characters and getting to know them but I still deal with themes that are important to me that and that I'm trying to make sense of similar to a lot of writers do you know you're writing to make sense of the world right mm -hmm. and at the time um, you know what what started the book going was um, one night when my youngest was about six weeks old, she stopped breathing. And uh, I and Murphy's Law would have it, my husband is interstate. <laughs> and so I put her and my toddler um, in the car. I still don't know why I didn't call an ambulance, actually. I was just in, I don't know, anyway. I, and I raced her to the Royal Children's. And anyway, they ended up saving her life. And um, we were there for a couple of days and, you know, they kind of send you away and I was really not ready to go home and I was sitting in the cafeteria at the hospital goodness knows what I look like <laughs> probably had you know goodness knows and uh, a woman came to me with a lanyard and all the official attire on and she said would you like me to sit with your baby and your toddler while you go to the toilet and have something to eat and I'm usually very bad at um, accepting help and I think I was too exhausted and emotional to say no and I said I would 
absolutely love that. And so I went to the toilet and I think I had the best white bread ham and cheese with fake pickle sandwich <laughs> I've had in my life. Uh, and we sat and I think as strangers often do, we just started talking and she said that she was an anaesthetist at the hospital and that she had growing children of her own and she was starting to look after her mother and that she essentially never felt as though she was doing a good job of any of it. That she was spread so thin across so many things that she basically lived in constant guilt and shame that she was falling below her own, what she called just the bare minimum standard constantly, every day. Um, and that the greatest lesson that the job had taught her was when she sees someone in need that she doesn't look away, that she sees them in their full humanity and I guess like she had seen me. And that night I went home and I wrote the opening line which is um, like a splinter in my finger. I always thought that if I left my mother alone she would work herself out. And I wanted to write a book which honoured the idea that I wanted to write about many, not just Layla, who's um, in her mid-late 40s, but multi-generations of women without looking away. And you did. It's a very beautiful, beautiful book. Very heavy. And I must kind of also stress, if you sit down to read with this book, there are a, very, a lot of heavy the uh, themes that uh, are throughout it. Um, so a trigger warning is advised. But it is an intensely rewarding book. Um, yeah. There's, hope. The, There's hope in it as well. Yes, well, that's kind of the point hope that I... Humor. Yeah, that's the, the, the point that I was going to kind of get to with it because, the, yes, there's, it, it talk, it's about how lo, um, messy life gets, particularly as we get older and our parents get older. Um, and as you mentioned, Layla is in a place of utter exhaustion um, in this book. She goes through a lot, um, and that's even before... Uh, no spoilers, but there are um, truths that come out about her family as the book progresses. Uh, while heavy, and I don't know where I was pulling from, but as you allude to, there is a feeling of hope that permeates uh, throughout this book that is magical. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> and I, it, it kind of, I, I have no comment or question to add here to you. I just was like, wow, I'm amazed at how beautiful the, the, that feeling of hope that comes through this, the entire story. I think that I wanted to, um, you know, at the time, this is when I'm going to start to get emotional. <laughs> I was looking after my father who was, who passed away and he passed away of Alzheimer's and you know, I think when we go through things like that in our life, there is such deep grief and such, um, it is so soul shaking. But what I witnessed during that time too, with the nurses and the other people around him was in the, in the deepest kind of sadness and grief, just how hopeful and human and amazing these people are. Mm. And I just wanted to, I guess, capture all of that so that, you know, I wasn't also looking away from the good things. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we can not look away from the truth of things. And I wanted to be honest. I wanted to write something true for all of the different ages in the book. But I also didn't want to look away from the really good stuff as well. It's the power of great storytelling. And it's the power of the, the things that books can, can give you. It can give you perspectives on things that you may not have seen before and it's a beautiful book and it's I also reacted very similarly John to yours to Firelight uh, because in my mind short stories I think are such a, an unappreciated form I think they're, they're they should be celebrated a lot more um, and I love that text got behind you and supported this collection it's a beautiful collection Firelight how best can you describe it this selection of stories um, it's mostly kind of science fiction and sort of horror themed stories, I suppose. Um, I guess that's the kind of stuff I've always enjoyed reading, particularly when I was growing up, so it had a big influence on me. Um, yes, I guess it's kind of like cover sort of different sort of um, kinds of narrative, I guess. So there's like a ghost story at the end, and some of the stories are a bit more comical than others. Um, two of them are quite long, so there's a novella, which is more of a kind of horror sort of story, I suppose, and then another, another novella, which is a kind of science fiction story. Um, but basically, it was sort of like the product of it's basically all the stuff I've produced, which I was happy with over the last like seven or eight years. Um, 
and there was a lot of other stuff I wrote during that time which just wasn't very good but that was these are the kind of what I was happy with at the end of the day so there's a lot of context and examination stuff you talk about colonialism and other impacts throughout these stories and I I kind of like stories like that um, where there's a lot of context bubbling below the surface um, because we live in a world, I think, that doesn't necessarily deserve subtlety. Sometimes you, you like stories that look you in the eye and tell you, hey, there's an issue here, you have to address this or look at this. And I love that you just have a passion for short fiction, just from everything that you have done so far. Why do you think short fiction is still so important today? Um, I think it's, I mean, I think it's one of those things where it's like, I think even if, you know, it's not like the most popular genre necessarily I think it's something which every writer does like obviously everyone sort of starts by writing short fiction I think so um, I think it's something which every writer kind of has a familiarity with I think even if it's not necessarily you know what they become known for what they what they publish um, and I think particularly I think particularly for like horror for instance I think you know short fiction is like still probably the best vehicle for it um, I think it's much harder there's certain things you can do with a short story which you just can't do with you know longer fiction obviously um, in terms of the ability to kind of maintain tension or build suspense and stuff, you can do that really effectively in a short story, um, which is much harder to pull off, I think, in a longer work, so, yeah. Yeah, and on a personal level, I mean, we were just talking about it uh, as everyone was coming in, um, but a few, in a few weeks ago, I interviewed Michaela Saunders, um, who, if you guys are not familiar with, she's um, a writer who put, put together an anthology uh, that John was a part of called This All Come Back Now, which is uh, Indigenous speculative fiction. It's a collection. She has got a book um, called Always uh, Always Will Be, which has come out. And the first book, uh, the first story, five minutes, it was included in that, in that uh, section. Um, if there's one genre that I recommend everyone try and pick up, it is the world of Indigenous futurism and it's stories like that. Um, and I believe I want to shout out one particular story from yours, the Auto Auto Oc, or how you ever pronounce that correctly. It's a story of a future alien contact, and it, there's questions of of imperialism abounding and a world of magic. It's such a great story. Um, what did writing this book sort of teach you in terms of your own experience, but also how? I got the sense there was a, a lot more. You were on a mission a little bit with this book in terms of trying to progress everything forward in terms of where we are. Yeah, I guess, um, yeah, I suppose I just kind of, um, you know, I think what every kind of writer wants to do really is sort of, you know, you always hope that there's, like, there are themes which people can pick up on and, um, you know, I think and they'll be in there regardless of whether you're trying to insert them or not because they're just sort of the things you're concerned with as a person that's going to be part of the work, you know, kind of inevitably um, if it's something which you're writing, which you care about. Um, and... I guess as well, like, because they were written over such a long period, um, I don't know, I think I was kind of consciously trying to figure out how I wanted to write or what kind of stories I wanted to tell. Um, so um, I think there's, like, a bit of change between the stories, I think even just in terms of, like, style and stuff like that, but I think that was just part of my... Because it was over such a long period, there's always going to be a bit of uh, diversity in that way. So I think, yeah, a big part of it was just trying to find a sort of narrative voice that worked for me, so... We honestly wish I could keep poking all three of you about your books. But another topic I kind of also want to talk to all three of you around is being debut authors, first time publishing a book, first time with a new experience. I also want to ask all three of you about your journey to publication. Uh, and Rosemary, I want to start with you, if that's okay. Because putting your memoir together, we, we've alluded, was a, a very much a challenge for you uh, and putting that together. But then you linked up with a Hunter Valley publishing house, uh, Catch Fire Press. Um, what was your experience actually having this book and putting it together and then seeing it come to life? Well, the book took five years to write and about five rewrites, I think. The first chapter probably took 50 rewrites. The first editor, I had. I didn't know what to do with the stories. So I wrote to Varuna at, uh, up at Katoomba and they suggested an editor and that editor changed my life because she said, you didn't really want to write a book of stories, did you? Oh, <laughs> yes, I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she said, you're not being honest. Readers demand honesty. 
you've got to let them know where you're coming from. I said, I can't write that. She said, you write that and you'll find endless women have had that same experience. It's a universal. You tap that universal and you'll have so many women that you affect. So that's what I did. Another edit editor amputated all my best stories, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Irrelevant, she said. <laughs> and it's like you've got to follow the signs to the end. You know, you're on a particular journey. And so when my son and daughter-in-law and the baby then came down for a year in Hobart, that was such a good chapter. Irrelevant. <laughs> I have a book box now of irrelevant stories. <laughs> that was a learning experience that you've got to take it on the chin. And then at the end, a fellow writer came and did all the hard little bits. It's like when you're painting a room, you know, you do the walls like that quickly. And then there are all the little bits that you have to fuss about and they've got to be perfect or it spoils the job. The same making a dress, actually. Now, a great, somebody in the writer's group, my first writer's group, did that. She knew how to apply all those uh, things you've got to put in the front of the book, you know, numbers and so on. She proofread it. She said, gosh, you've repeated yourself here, you know, and did things like that. And she actually handed me the story in a book like that. And then there was the artist who painted my portrait and said, that's your cover. So all these things contributed to me holding the book, finished book, in my hand. And the last thing was, all right, so I've got a book. How do I... I don't think I can be bothered with a publisher. I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> And then I was having a cup of tea one afternoon with two women and we were talking about books and publishing. And I said, well, I haven't got a publisher. And those two women looked at each other <laughs> and they said, we think we've got enough money in Kitty to publish another book. We'll have a look at publishing yours. No contract. My editor said, oh, you can't do that, no contract. And I said, why not? This is Newcastle. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's what happened. I love it. It's, and it, it also is a, a, a universal a reminder for so many people. Some, sometimes the actual world of getting published can be a very daunting place because you're pitching your book to places and it can feel like a tough process. And it, there is a lot of people who are doing that themselves and finding fantastic success doing it. Um, it's, and it, it, it highlights how collaborative the process is. I know, John, you had a very different sort of experience because you went through through text publishing and you managed uh, like a, a mentorship of, of sorts and a deal. Like, what was, it, what was that like after doing anthologies and being published in Mianjin and, and Overland? Um, yeah, I was really fortunate. Um, it's, a, it's called the Boundless Fellowship. It's a fellowship for um, unpublished um, First Nations writers. Um, and essentially, you send in, you know, 10,000 word extract of something which you're working on and then they... Um, if they like it, then um, they'll put you in touch with a mentor. So um, my mentor was Kim Scott, which was an enormous honor um, to work with Kim Scott. Um, and also they get an option of a publication with, with text as well, which is very generous. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's, yeah, it's really grateful for the opportunity because like you said, it's just very dispiriting trying to get published sometimes. And I think, um, you know, even trying to get published in magazines can be really difficult. I think, you know, um, it's good to remind yourself sometimes that, you know, if something's not getting published, it's not necessarily a reflection on the quality. It's just, you know, it really depends on the taste of the person who's reading it and people's tastes vary, obviously, so, yeah. Yeah, very true. It's, it it's, it's often can be somewhat... It can feel so demoralising when you're trying to go that route because 
yeah, I mean, I, you probably would have been knocked back so many times doing uh, with any sort of work that then all of a sudden someone picks up and goes, hey, this, is, this piece of work is amazing and it's gone on to do really well. Um, Megan, I know that you've kind of had a uni more unique experience to everyone because, you know, you worked in the publishing space before, beforehand, kind of transitioning over to writing. Um, and I've always wanted to have someone who, uh, to ask this kind of question of. No. <laughs> but what's it like being on the other side <laughs> of that experience? And did it change the way, you know, you look at the process of, of putting a book together and, uh, you know, and, how, and working with a, with a team like you, ha you did at HarperCollins? I don't know if you're going to like my answer. <laughs> um, because I always feel like I need to this debunk this kind of um, thing because so I'm 45 and I worked in at Allen and Unwin when I was 21. And I worked under Sue Hines for a number of years and I worked in nonfiction. And so um, I worked in a very particular part of the publishing industry and um, it did teach me a few things, which I'll get to in a second. But I really like to stress with people that you know, after that, um, I went into communications and I ended up being the marketing um, director at the State Library of Victoria. So most of my career was in marketing communications or in communications in the arts and things like that. And so I really, you know, and then I had children and I was a work from home mum for 12 years, really, before I, you know, all those things that I spoke about before made me realise. And I started to look at my children and go... I don't take any of the advice that I'm actually giving you. Chase your dreams, I'd say. You can do anything with hard work and I just wouldn't make the time to write because there was something always to do. There was, I had to make dinner or I had to get a project done. I had to put food on the table and own money and um, those things always feel more... Fold socks, pair socks, you know? I mean, the hours that you spend doing these things, right? Um, so I finally just wanted to take my own advice, but I really love to stress that, um, you know, I knew no one I knew no one in the industry. I, even though I had taught at RMIT for many years, again, that was an old life for me. Um, so when I had a manuscript that was basic, I felt like it could be ready to send to someone, I quite literally looked at, um, at agents because uh, the two things that I did know um, was that I couldn't, unless I was submitting for a prize or so forth, it's very hard to submit what's called an unsolicited manuscript to most publishers. You have to go through an agent or some kind of other means. And so I thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll find an agent. And I also, because I knew that if somebody offered me a book deal, I'd sign for a dollar quite happily because <laughs> I'm terrible at those types of things. I'd be like, you want to sign me? Absolutely. In fact, I may have paid them. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so I needed someone to have those conversations for me. Um, and so I just kind of looked at different agents in Australia and I knew, um, you know, I had read Holly Ringland's work and I thought, you know, my work sits in that kind of vein. And so I looked at who her agent was and it was Benithan at Zeitgeist. Um, and so I quite literally, um, my, the, my family and I were down on holiday in Wye River in a caravan park and I drove up the hill to get reception and I emailed inquiries at zeitgeist.com.au, <laughs> my manuscript, because they were open for submission. So you can look at different agents and publishers um, who do accept them and they have open for submission times. And I just emailed it and kind of thought, OK, well, we'll see how we go. Um, and, and so basically then what happened very quickly is that he got back to me. He liked it enough um, that he was happy to sign me, which is fantastic. And then we got it kind of in a... Um, it, where we felt it was ready to send to publishers. So he sent it out to six publishers, the, the usual ones you can think of, and they then have a certain amount of time to respond if they would like to um, put in an offer, basically. And so they had like six weeks, whatever it was, or just before Christmas, and of course these things never go to plan and people wait to the last minute. So it was literally, it was, it was the ner most nerve-wracking time in my whole life because in my mind I was kind of like, you know, this is really my last... I, in my mind it was my last shot because I was like, I had sacrificed so much to get this book done, you know, waking up early and riding in the car when the girls were in dance class or swimming, you know, like getting any spare amount of time that I could. And right at the end we were really lucky that five publishers came back with offers and then what happens is it goes to auction. <laughs> 
so, yeah. <laughs> so and that's fun. <laughs> the yeah, open. yeah. So and then so they put in offers, and then um, I chose ended up choosing Harper Collins with Catherine Milne, who is. Catherine Milne is like my Harry Styles or Taylor Swift, right? <laughs> She's, that's what she was like for me. Um, and then so I signed with Catherine Milne, who does, of course, Trent and Holly and, and others. And um, and I basically had, yeah, that journey with HarperCollins. And then after that, it um, got signed by US. So it's coming out in US in January in hardback. Wow, that's awesome. And then yeah. film and TV with Aquarius, who did the film Lion, if you know oh. the film Lion. With Nicole Cogman, so so you're, it's getting adapted for film. Uh, probably TV series, I think they wow. do more these days. But um, what, a, what a flex! There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's awesome. That's really yeah. I think that's that's worth a round of applause. <laughs> As a, as a last question, kind of directed to all the panel, I'll throw it to, to, to all of you, and I'll, I'll, John, I'll get the response from you first. Which would be, is what advice you know would you give? To, to other writers or people around, you know, about starting out, starting that manuscript, short story collection, poetry, whatever it may be. What's, if you could give one piece of sage advice having come to the end of this process, what would it be? Um, I guess just, like, keep at it. Like, you generally just, like anything, you only get better at it by a lot of, you know, repetition and you'll always have things you need to improve on and you like, can only improve on that by just doing it again and again. So, um, and that means it can take a lot of time before you feel like you've got anything you're happy with, but... Um, you know, often what you're doing is better than what you think it is. Like you always, you, often your harshest, own harshest critic, so you often can't see the kind of value of what you're writing until you know someone else reads it for you, or you come back to it sometime later. And but really, it's just persistence. I think is the main thing. So, yeah, Ab absolutely. Rosemary, this sounds facetious. <laughs> the best advice I can give you, I've already said it, is discipline. Mm. And the way to achieve that is to have a good relationship with your cat. <laughs> 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 because I had such a good personal relationship with Zephy. <laughs> and Zephy got me up every morning, winter, whatever, at six o'clock. And she stayed up and we did it whatever you do in the morning, you know, exercise routine, showering, finishing up with a cup of tea on the balcony, and in the winter she'd be there by my feet, shivering and hunched, but she'd be there. And then when a cup of tea was over, back into the house, she'd precede me, <laughs> all the way into the study. She knew her chair, her cushion, there. She knew my place there, pen in hand, and she went to sleep, and I started work. That's the best advice, really, <laughs> practical. <laughs> yes. I reckon that's the best advice we've ever had. <laughs> Absolutely. I can follow that. Yeah. Good luck following that, Meg. <laughs>Come to, we'll finish off this, this discussion. I always like to kind of finish off with rapid fire questions, just fling them at you guys and give you the first answer that comes to your head. What we'll do is we'll go from, uh, from John to, to Meg. Um, I will throw a question and we'll just go one by one, give you the first answer that comes to your head. Um, and the first question I want to ask, which I know I've, I've given to you guys a little bit of prep for this one, but what is your first up is what is your favourite book have you read that you've read in the last 12 months? Favourite book? Um, I read a really good um, book called The Box Man by Kobo Abe. It's like a kind of Japanese sort of psychological horror novel, I guess. It's really mm -hmm. creepy. It was, it was cool, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Megan? Uh, I just... I'm a big Michael Ondaatje fan, <laughs> and um, I just finished his most recent collection of poetry. I think it's the, called The Year of Lost Things, or Last Things, sorry, Year of Lost mm -hmm. Things, mm -hmm. and it's, in, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. It's really good. Yeah. Um, because we are themed around debut books... Uh, what is your favourite debut that you have ever read? John? Um, actually, I read a really good book this year, um, Miguel Street. It was V.S. Naipaul's first book, um, and that was really good. Really kind of funny and sad, and you can just see, like, he already knew what he was doing in that book, and he just kind of developed that for his later work, but, mm. yeah, I really recommend, yeah. Rosemary? My favourite debut novel, Anne of Green Gables, oh. by Lucy Maud Montgomery, 
1908. <laughs> Great book. Great book. Great book. Great. Love it. <laughs> Meg. Why do I have to keep following you? I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> I feel like I've thrown you under the bus. Man, um, so my favourite debut is called I for Isabel by an Australian writer called Amy Whitting. And I read it every year. And Amy Whitting actually, that's not her, it's a pen name, but she wrote that debut when she was, I think she's in her 70s, could be even 80s, and that was her debut. And she ended up winning the Age Book of the Year for her follow-up to it, Isabel on the Way to the Corner Shop. Oh, I love it. That's great. Here's a tough question. Do you have a favourite word? Any sort of word? Yeah, no. A favourite word. Could be anything. Um, I don't know. Maybe something amorphous. That's a good word, I think. Oh, that's a good word. I like that. Yeah. Rosemary, do you have a favourite word? Is... Well, it's a word I'm not allowed to say. <laughs> <laughs> they are the best words, aren't they? <laughs> words that you're not allowed to say. Great <laughs> Meg, can you top that? <laughs> I'm sitting in that chair next time. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, my favourite word's plum. Oh, that's a great word. Just because I like saying it. It's a very satisfying word to say. <laughs> you know, like, some, like mine is succulent. I don't know why. <laughs> different phases and feelings you get to it. I don't understand. And what you can describe as succulent. It's a, it's a good word. You walk into a lift. What? <laughs> and your absolute hero is in there. Your absolute hero. The one person in your life who you would absolutely want to meet more than anyone else. Who is it? John. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> Could be yeah. anyone. I guess there are a lot of people I admire, but I'm not sure I'd necessarily want to meet them. I feel like I'd be kind of boring for them. But <laughs> yeah, like, I guess, like, for literary, it'd be cool to meet Phil K. Dick, I guess. That'd be interesting. Oh, that'd be great. <laughs> I'm sure he'd be off his head, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Rosemary, do you have anyone you would love to meet? Well, if it's a hero, it'd have to be somebody really... Sexy and good looking. Yes. But I just can't think, I'd rather think of a heroine. And I just can't think of it. There are just so many women that I could choose. So I'll pass. Fair enough. <laughs> Me? Um, my great grandmother. Oh, that's um, a great one. I never got to meet her. And she, yeah, she was, um, went through a lot to have me here, so. Yeah, I love that. And then a final last question, because I'm, I think we're very lucky that we have such a diverse range of people here um, <laughs> from such a wide background. So I'm gonna finish off with uh, probably the most the hardest question you could possibly ask. What's the meaning of life? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's the meaning of life in your opinion? What matters? I think it's just happiness, you know, just try and live as happily as you can. <laughs> I like it. Rosemary? I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry, Meg. I feel like I've, I've done you a disservice. <laughs> Fire. Uh, I would say to be loved and to love. That's a great one. Love that. Um, I honestly could chat to you guys all day. I honestly could and keep firing questions. But we'll finish off with a final question, which is kind of what is next for, for all of you? And Rosemary, I want to ask you first, will we see more stories out of the alternative stories that got kicked out by your editor? Will we see more? I've got two ideas. One is uh, a work of fiction, which comes from my own experience, and it'll be about a mother-son relationship. Mm. And the other one will be stories that I've been writing for some time and the stories are about what's happening around me because what I find happening is endlessly amusing and sad all the mm. time and they're in this country that I called Elderstan which is of the elderly and so it starts at about age 30 I think that's when people show their age and goes on a long time. So lots of stories about what's happening around me, including stories from the balcony where I have a whole virtual reality. People I don't know in one sense, but who I know intimately in another. Oh, I'm excited to see about that. Meg, what do you have next? 
Uh, so I'm working on my second novel. I was very lucky to sign a two-book deal after the first. And so I'm working on my second novel, which is called The Anatomy of Tears. And it's inspired by um, and based upon the fact that when we photograph our tears under a microscope, they all look different for different emotions. Mm-hmm. And so I'm working with the woman who actually discovered that is a San... Yeah, it's pretty amazing, isn't it? I, I still get excited by it. But um, she's an American photographer. She lives in San Francisco and her name's Rosalind Fisher and she discovered this and she's given me permission to kind of use that idea and I'm working with her on that. So it's about a pain psychologist who's essentially running away from her own pain. Wow, that sounds amazing. I had no idea about that tears can be... Wow, that's incredible. John? Um, yeah, working on a novel at the moment, but, you know, early days, very early days. So. <laughs> <laughs> it always feels like yeah. that whenever you're, like, right yeah. in the depths of it. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I could honestly chat with you guys all day. Um, you guys have been a huge amount of fun, but unfortunately we're coming to the end um, of this session. I would like to wish a warm thank you to Rosemary Lewis, to John Morrissey, and to Megan Rogers for joining me today. Um, please give a warm thank you to these guys. <laughs> If you, if you enjoyed this discussion, let us know. The Newcastle Writers' Festival is on all the socials and you can share it around with the hashtag NWF2024. Straight after this, our wonderful authors will be down for a special book signing down in the foyer um, at the Festival Bookshop on the ground floor. Come and grab a copy of their books. Have a conversation. Uh, and again, thank you to all, all the people who are listening online. And lastly, I'd off, last, lastly like to offer a special thank you to all of our amazing volunteers who I think have done an amazing job this whole weekend uh, and they make this entire festival possible Um, and please give the chance to say thank you to all of the amazing volunteers when you get the chance Um, I wish stay safe uh, out there I know this is probably one of the last events of the Newcastle Writers Festival thank you so much for supporting this festival for supporting the Australian book industry and incredible events like this we couldn't do it without you I hope you guys have enjoyed it thank you very much Thank you for listening to today's episode of Date With A Debut and for listening to the Words and Nerds channel. You can buy all books mentioned in today's episode down in the description box. And if you enjoyed the show or indeed any episode of Words and Nerds, drop us a review, leave us five stars or a thumbs up. It is hugely appreciated. Catch you soon.